I've already obtained it or I've already become perfect, but I press on so that Please I may... Please stand the floor. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. Uh, I'll start over. Uh, t again, today's scripture reading comes from Philippians 3, 12 through 16. Not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which I also I, I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching f forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. <laughs> Let us therefore, as many as are perfect, have this attitude, and if in anything you have a different attitude, God will reveal that also to you. However, let us keep living by that same standard to which we have attained. Thank you. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. And uh, I would like to, before we get to dive into the word, please join in me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us here to get to know you more and be able to worship you today. So, Lord, would you, as we dive into your word, would you, help, would you give us wisdom? And would you open our eyes so that we may see your truth and so that we may live by your truth? In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right. So, good morning. Um, <laughs> as you all know, we have been walking through the, uh, the letter, Paul's letter to the Philippians for several weeks now. And today we are at chapter 3. Verse 12 to 16. Now, this is a section where, chapter 3 is a section where Paul is elaborating on his exhortation to the Philippians. And the exhortation is to rejoice in the Lord. And just before today's passage, so last week, we saw Paul's dedication and his devotion to the gospel. And him declaring how he considers all things as loss so that he may, gain, he may gain Christ. No, he may know Christ and to gain Christ and to be found in Christ. Because this surpasses all value that he knows. So to him, he considers all things as loss. And that was last week's passage. Now, if you think about it, that's a great news. So if you would consider all things as loss, that you may know Christ, so that you may gain Christ and be found in Christ, this is a great thing it's because you get to take, part take part in his death and resurrection. It's not just his death, but also in his resurrection. But although Paul reminds us that this is by not our righteousness by the law, but it's by the righteousness of God, in, your, in the faith in Christ Jesus, when Paul gives you an extreme example like his story, like him, it's very, very hard not to compare ourselves to him. So if you think about Paul's example that he gives in the, in the first section of chapter 3, it's him laying out all the things that he has accomplished and or all the things that he has achieved or all the things that he has, such as him being the Jew of Jews, following all the, all the law to the, to the letter, and him being part of Rome as, as a Roman citizen, and him being part of the Pharisees or even the Sanhedrin, him taking all that into account and considering all that as loss, if that's the example that he gives us, it's really hard not to you know, see ourselves in comparison to him. But maybe you're really good at, you know, being like Paul. Maybe you're really good at following Christ. So you would, you would say, I have considered all things as loss, or at least many things as loss. I, I spend a lot of time at church. I do a lot of things at church. I do a lot of things with church people. So that's not a problem for me. Well, well, but the thing is, if you consider where Philippians are at for, during this time of this letter, Philippians are what Paul would call model church. They're a very good church. They've been doing good things for the gospel. 
And they have been a good Christian amongst their community. And they have been good to each other. And they are very good at supporting other Christian communities and Christians. So to Paul, Philippians are what he would consider partners in, in the gospel. Because he says, you know, you have been doing very well. But the thing is, to the Philippians, the example they have to follow is Paul. So no matter how good we have been doing, I don't know if you've ever, ever heard the phrase, no matter how good you are, there's always someone better than you. Maybe you've heard the you know, more popular one, no matter how good you are, there's always an Asian better than you. <laughs> and to them, that Asian is Paul, because Paul is Middle East Asian. You know. But that's a joke, but anyways. With the jokes aside, consider, consider what Philippians are looking at here. Philippians are receiving letters from Paul, and, the, and Paul is giving them him, himself as the example. So it, it's very possible to be actually discouraged by his example. Because no matter how good you are doing, it seems like you fall short of Paul. So because who would genuinely and confidently be able to say, I have considered all things as loss. But this is exactly what Paul doesn't want them to think. Paul does not want to discourage them in this, but instead he wants to encourage them. So that, that's why he's writing this section. Verse 12 to 16, this is exactly what Paul is trying to point to to be encouraged, not discouraged. So in light of this, there are a few things that I want to highlight about this little passage how, and see how Paul encourages them. Okay? So if you would please go to the next slide, and there, there are three things that I want to point out. And the first is, what are they or are, what are we encouraged to do? And second is, why should we be encouraged? And three is how we should respond to all of this. So first, what are we encouraged to do? So as Paul starts this paragraph, he reminds them that he has not attained perfection. Despite all the things that he has done, he has, he has given up a lot of things and he has devoted a lot of things but he still has not attained perfection. So he reminds them of that. And the reason is, no matter how mature and immature you are, he says, verse 16, let us keep living by the same standard to which we have attained. This is verse 16. Now, Paul wants the Philippians to be encouraged. And the reader to be encouraged to continue living up to the same standard. Which means that while Paul seems to have attained so much in the eyes of the Philippians or other believers. Even though Paul has, a, Paul has a sort of attained this position within the church where it's almost unsurpassable. Even with all of that he is still striving towards the same goal as all of us because he still has not attained perfection. And that word to, uh, to live by is the Greek word stoichain. So if you, if you would show that slide. So this word to live by is the Greek word stoichain. And stoichain is actually a military term it means to get in the same line, get in line. It means to march together in a line. So it means, it means Paul is saying, this is not a walk that you do by yourself. This thing that we do, this living up to the same standard, this is, it's not something that you do by yourself. 
But instead, you do, you do the living of the standard with others by being in the same line and marching together. So this is what we're encouraged to do so that you would get in line and march together so that you would strive together towards the same goal. It's pretty simple, right? That's what Paul wants you to be encouraged to do. But the important part is the reason why. Why should we be encouraged by Paul? Why should we be encouraged by anybody else in the church? Maybe you wouldn't need to go as far as Paul. You would just need to look at someone else in the, in the church, in, within the body. And why would they be an encouragement to us to keep pursuing the same goal? Because it kind of seems like, kind of seems like when someone is ahead of you, you feel discouraged because they are so far ahead of you. So think of rock climbing. I'm, uh, I do this with youth students, but could you raise your hand if you've ever been rock climbing before? Rock climbing? Ah, okay. Okay. I'm not a climber. I've never been an actual, I've never actually gone to like, a mountain or a cliff to go climbing. So I don't know much about rock climbing, but as I was looking into it, you know, just looking at it on the internet is easier than go, actually going to do it. But, you know, as I was looking into it, I was wondering how you do, you know, you, you see movies and like other, like, you know, clips of people doing like rock, rock climbing, and you see people being connected with ropes, and you're like connected to each other, and you as you climb and like you climb together and all that. I was wondering what that was, and that's called apparently that's called multi pitch climbing, which means one rope is not enough for you to get to the top. So you you have multiple you you move your anchors as you go up. So you don't do these alone, but instead what you do is you have a leader who climbs up first, and he puts an anchor into the cliff, and he secures himself in a position so the second person can go up and they can pass you. So as they go up, they're secured by your anchor, by you, so that even if they fall, they'll only fall as far as where you are. So as the person passes you, they secure themselves there, and then you go up, and then you repeat that until you get to the top. Now, as I was learning about this on the web, not actually, but as I was learning about this on paper, this seems, this seems like what we do as Christians. So when someone is ahead of you, like Paul, they're the ones that are being the belayer or secure point or anchors to you. So that when you walk, when you climb, you are, you are being helped and being secured by your peer who is there for you, who is ahead of you, in fact. So when you look at Paul, that's, how, that's what you want to walk with. So when, you're, when you look at Paul, we, like some, sometimes we can, we can say, or other people around you, I guess. You might be encouraged by their presence. It's, oh, look at, look at that person. I can, you know, attain like, like him. I can achieve as much as him. But if you, if you think about it, as you climb higher and higher, what you realize is you have so much more to go. Uh, if you would put the, other, uh, the next picture up. So this is a person looking up at a cliff as they climb up. So again, I've never been climbing, but I've ran before, and I'm not a very good runner either. <laughs> 
So as I'm running and I look ahead, I can't even see the goal. Then I'm like, uh, how much further do I have to go? And with climbing, I would assume the same thing. As you climb, if you're climbing like several hundred meters, then you won't even be able to see the top. And the person that you're climb, climbing with is about, you know, just far enough that you can still, you know, be in uh, communication with them and you can still see them. So if you climb together, at some point, you're just wondering, when is this going to end? When is it going to end? So no matter how many people are climbing with you, as time goes, as, as you climb up this cliff, you will hit a point where you will be discouraged by the very fact that you guys are all in the same, same thing, same place. So how should we be, why should we be discouraged, I mean, encouraged by Paul's words to continue press on. It's because what you are relying on to reach the end goal is actually not the person next to you or person in front of you. It's not even your own strength. It's not, it's not the rope that's tying you guys together, but it's, it's the anchor and the rope that is coming down from the top. So we tend to think, as we climb this mountain, we tend to think we, we are, this is a multi-pitch uh, climbing, we're, we're moving the anchor together as we go. But in fact, it's something else. So if you guys ever been indoor rock climbing, it's a little easier. So indoor rock climbing, they always, if you're a beginner, they, they will give you a rope that comes from the ceiling and they attach, to, attach it to you. So if, if, you, if you fall, you'll just fall slowly rather than just <laughs> splattering on the floor. This is called top rope climbing. I'm, not, I'm like laying out all these terms to you, but I, that I don't even really know. But top rope climbing <laughs> means, apparently, it means that you have a rope that's coming from the end goal all the way to you. So you're attached to this one rope so that you can make it all the way to the top. That's top rope climbing. And what we need to realize is that we are not relying on each other's anchors, but it's the anchor at the top that Jesus has put. And this is what Paul means when he says, I have not attained perfection, but I try to lay hold of what has been laid hold of me by Christ Jesus. It's not us claiming, it's not us grabbing hold of things so that we can make it to the top. No, it's Christ Jesus who lays hold of you. It's not you making the anchor as you go up. It's not somebody else that, that's creating the anchor for you to be secured in. But it's Christ Jesus who has secured you. By holding you. This is the Greek word uh, katalambano. Katalambano is the word for seizing, catching, grabbing onto. If you, if, you, if you can show the slide. And this word appears over and over again. This is what Paul, this is what Paul starts with. Paul is trying to grab hold onto the very thing that Jesus has grabbed him with. You see how this works? The reason why you should be encouraged is, is not because Paul is ahead of you. It's not because some other pastor is ahead of you. It's not because some other deacon is ahead of you that you can depend on them. No, it's because the thing you're trying to get hold of is the thing, is the very fact that Jesus has already taken hold of you. And he's the anchor at the top. Now, what does this mean for 
us. So what does it mean for all of us? Paul says he presses on because he is, he, it's not because of the things that he has attained. It's not because of the, the things that he sees of, but it's Christ that sees him. So it means whatever you do in any circumstances, you are always going to the top. No matter how slow you move, no matter how mature or immature you are, because you are attached to the top, you will eventually make it. That's why Paul can say, forget about the things in the, that's behind you, but look forward to reach forward to the goal, towards the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So now, now, I don't know if you've ever been to, you know, a, any sort of climbing. But I think all of us are pretty scared of heights. And this one time I went on a retreat and we had an activity called pole climbing. You guys know what a telephone pole is, right? Telephone pole is about, I would say, 12 meters, like 11, 12 meters high. It's about 30 feet high. And the idea is that you would climb onto it and then, uh, you know, and you do stuff at the top. And it, it's not like, a, it's not as, like, it's not the pole climbing that some of the adults might be thinking of. You don't, like, use a rope to, like, do the, like, Mulan climbing. No, 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 that's, uh, that's not what you do. But this pole is a really easy pole. It has a, it has a pole on the side that you grab onto. So it's, like, it's easy. It's like a, it's like a ladder. You go up. But every single person who went up, as you reach the top, you get slower and slower and slower. And at the very top, you're supposed to stand on the pole to jump and to grab something in, the, in midair. That's how, that's how you come down. It's pretty crazy, right? But once you get to the top, what happens is that science, but your center of gravity goes higher and higher. What happens then? The thing shakes. The pole shakes. So I don't know if you knew, but like poles, like it's wood. So it's shaking. And the higher you go, it's shaking more. So every time, every time someone tries to do this activity, like they'll climb the first half in like 10, 15 seconds. And then the second half takes like 10 minutes. Because they're like, doing one by one, it's like, is this going to be okay? And by the time they go up, to take that first step is shaking like crazy. So I don't know if you, I don't know, if you know, but like when, when you go up something and you're trying to jump, you have to like sort of like get two feet on there, right? As soon as you get the two feet on there, you're shaking like this. If you're shaking like this, 30 feet high, that's scary. So... A lot of people actually fail to jump off of it, period, because they're like, no, 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 not, I'm not doing this. But some few people who are brave enough to jump, they jump off of it, and they're like, oh, oh, with a sigh, like, sigh of relief. You know why? Because they have a rope attached to them. They have a rope attached to them so they don't fall. You know, obviously, like, you don't want people just, you know, so you have a rope. Attached to you the whole time. It's not like they attach to you at the top, but it's, you have a rope the whole time. But as you go up to the top, you forget that you have a rope on the, on the back. So the first time you go up, it, literally everybody takes at least 10 minutes up there. So it's like, do I, do I take this step? Do I, do I go up? Do I jump? Well, you know, the funny thing I found is that Every time they do it, their time, the, the record decreases drastically. So the first time, it took them 10 minutes to jump. The second time, it took them 2 minutes to jump. And the third time, it took them 30 seconds to jump. And the, I think the record for the whole thing was 8 seconds. 
Guess why? It's because once they experienced that they can trust the rope that they're attached to, now they have no fear. Once you go up the top, and if you still have fear and doubts about whether this rope is actually going to secure me, you're going to have a difficult time taking that next step. But once you find out this rope is actually going to save you from falling, then everything else is irrelevant. At some point, we have one of the kids like didn't even use their hands as they go up. That sounds crazy, but they did. Because they knew the rope is going to secure them no matter what. It doesn't matter where they fall. So the, the kid who did eight seconds, he pretty much ran up the pole. And he jumped and he grabbed the, grabbed the pole, like he grabbed the, like, I, I would say like a, yeah, it's another pole in midair. So he, he grabbed onto it. And he's like, so easy. Who knew? This is what Paul is trying to get. If you look back and you don't trust in the thing that is securing you, if you don't trust in the fact that Jesus is the one that grabbed hold of you, and if you still think that you're the one that's grabbing onto Jesus, then every single time, every step, every feet that you go up, you're going, to be, you're, going, you're going to be slowing down as you go. Because you know what? The higher you go, the scarier it gets. As you walk with Jesus, as you get more mature in Jesus, the further you walk with him, the more scary it might become. Because as, as Paul says, as you walk in this walk, you are considering things for uh, things as loss because of the surpassing value of gaining Christ. But until you get to that point, until you get to the point where you can trust that Jesus has hold of you, Every time you try to lose something for the gain of Christ, it's going to be scary. So what Paul is trying to remind the Philippians to do is to keep on striving towards the goal that you have attained. But he's not just giving them empty words. He's reminding them that Jesus has their back. Jesus is the one that's holding them. If you don't know this, then your walks are going to be incredibly difficult. And you won't be able to rejoice in the Lord. Remember, the whole point of this section is to rejoice in the Lord. But as you strive towards the goal, if you are not able to rely on him, then how can you rejoice in the Lord? Going back to the rock climbing example, if you go up, not 30 feet, but if you go up like 80, 90 feet up on the mountain, and if you are not secured in, in his anchor, on his anchor, then when you look back, well, the, one of the first things that climbers will tell you is not to look down. But if you look down, how are you going to move forward? But once you are secured in Christ Jesus and you know that you are going to make it because he has you anchored to the goal, that's when you can forget about what lies behind and reach forward and continue on with your walk. So how should we respond to this? What does he want? How does he want us to respond to this? 
he, Paul says, as many as many as as many have attained perfection, let us continue to have this attitude. And if you have a different attitude, God will reveal even that to you. What does he mean by that? What is the attitude that he wants us to have? The attitude is that you, striving forward, knowing that Jesus has got your back. And you, striving forward, knowing that you have not attained perfection. So this, this hits, I think this hits generally everybody. Because in one way, if you think you're mature in faith, and if you think you're, you know, ahead of the game, and you think you're ahead of the pack, then you still ought to have the same attitude of you striving forward. And if you lose that, you have a, he says, different attitude, a.k.a. if you lose the drive to continue go, to go forward, then God will reveal even that to you. Maybe you're on the other end of the spectrum. You think you're way, way behind. So many people are ahead of you. And you look up, and it's so far to go, so much further to go. And if you think, you know what, this, this is too hard. It's not worth it. If you have that attitude, let God reveal that to you. For what purpose? So that you may continue striving forward. So what is your attitude towards all this? What is your attitude towards the walk with Jesus? As we walk with Jesus in our, in our faith, there's going to be times where it's, we are so encouraged and so you know, full of spirit that we feel like we can do anything. Kind of like, like how the students who found out there's a rope attached to them. They feel like they can do anything, like running on the pole. But there are going to be times where you feel like there's nothing holding you. There's nothing securing you. You feel like make one wrong move and you'll, fi- you'll fall right to the bottom. Paul says no to both of them. Listen. If you think you can do anything and everything, it's not because of your strength. It's because Jesus has your back. If you think you can't do anything and you you can't seem to make one step towards God, you, you need to be reminded that Jesus has your back. So would you ask God to reveal this to you? Reveal what your attitude towards this walk is. Because sometimes we, can't, we don't even know what, where we are at. But would you ask God to reveal your heart to yourself? So that when God reveals it to you, you might respond and say, I will not look back and reach forward towards the goal, towards the upward call that is in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Our walk in faith in this world can be so, so difficult that we can't seem to take another step before we fall to the ground. 
And Lord, there, sometimes it seems so easy that we may, we may feel like we've already attained perfection. So Lord, would you reveal all of that to us? Lord, are there hearts in this room that feel like they are frozen with fear? Would you reveal that to them and show them that you have got them in your hands? If there are anyone in this room who feel like they are so exhausted from the walk or they feel like they come so far, they don't need to go any further. Lord, would you reveal even that? Show them the glory that is waiting for them at the top. So that they may not look to themselves, not to, not to anything behind, but Lord, continue to reach forward. Lord, it is you and it is only you that secures us in our walk. So Lord, Every single day, every single step that we take, Lord, would you remind us that you have us in your hands. So that we may take the next step with hope. We may take the next step with joy. So that we may live rejoicing in the Lord. Because you have called us to joy and hope, not to despair. Lord, we lift all that up to you as we walk with you, Lord. Remind us constantly and daily so that we may continue our walk with you. In Jesus' name I pray.